Okay. Well, now let us begin the first session, which will lay out the main issues and questions of this year's conference. And the introductory session will be moderated by Mr. Maurice Obstfeldt, the Economic Counselor and Director of Research Department at the IMF. And prior to assuming his current position, he served as a professor at UC Berkeley. Now let me hand over the microphone to him. So ladies and gentlemen, please give him a big round of applause. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Master of Ceremonies. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I would also like to add my thanks to the uh, Ministry of uh, Strategy and Finance, to the BOK, and to uh, the Peterson Institute for joining the fund in uh, putting together this marvelous and timely conference. Um, I woke up this morning to the news that um, Stanley Fisher uh, after yet another tour of exemplary public service would be stepping down as vice chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. And I couldn't help but think that uh, exactly uh, 20 years ago this month at the Hong Kong uh, annual meetings of the fund and the uh, World Bank, uh, Mr. Fisher, as he is still referred to in the fund, um, gave a well-known speech, uh, which uh, uh, although it was somewhat ill-timed, was very, very important. Uh, suggesting that the uh, fund's articles of agreement might be amended to uh, give it a role in um, guiding countries toward financial account convertibility uh, in a way that it had, uh, for, for all its life, guided them toward current account convertibility. Now, of course, this, this uh, idea was overwhelmed in the, uh, in the uh, blowback from the Asian crisis of, uh, of uh, that year and the, um, the following year. But uh, as Managing Director Lagarde said, uh, Asia learned a tremendous amount from that crisis. Uh, the fund learned a tremendous amount as well. And 10 years later, when uh, an even uh, more virulent crisis struck, um, Asia was very, uh, very resilient. Now, Asia, uh, today is the most dynamic part of the world economy. Uh, according to our forecasts, uh, we expect it to grow at 5.5% uh, on average this year and next. But Asia also faces um, great challenges. And those challenges are going to be the subject of our discussions today and uh, tomorrow. Um, at the risk of uh, leaving, leaving some things out, um, I'll just list a few. Uh, and I view these as very, very, um, very interlinked uh, problems. Um, for one thing, the problem that uh, Stan Fisher talked about of uh, navigating volatile capital flows is still, uh, is still very much with us. Um, but there's also the issue of, of low growth in the advanced economies and the implication that uh, long-term real rates of interest may be low for a very long time, posing challenges for monetary policy as well as other challenges. Uh, the future of technology as a global growth driver is very much in question, and we'll be talking about that uh, quite a bit in this, in this panel. Uh, and it's been mentioned, um, demographics are a major theme. Populations are aging. Uh, as the fund pointed out in its last regional economic outlook, uh, some Asian economies are at risk of growing old before they, uh, they, become, they become rich. Um, at some level, the, the very success of Asia uh, in uh, achieving higher incomes, in becoming such a large part of the global economy, has helped fuel some of the tensions in a number of advanced economies which now threaten protectionist responses. And Governor Lee uh, alluded to this uh, when he talked about the Asian growth model earlier, earlier this morning. Um, related to that, shifts in global leadership um, in the geopolitical landscape uh, are very significant for Asia. Uh, one symptom was the US abrupt uh, withdrawal from the, uh, the TPP agreement. And it leaves policymakers and uh, 
populations very much uh, uncertain about uh, what the future holds. Um, so there'll be much to discuss today, and uh, it's an honor to be able to kick off that discussion with two um, uh, incredibly distinguished and I think very appropriate speakers. Um, to my left, Adam Posen uh, has been president since 2013 of the uh, Peterson Institute for International Economics, uh, our neighbor in Washington. Um, Adam received his PhD from Harvard in 1994 and joined the staff of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And uh, while there was one of the co-authors of one of the fundamental uh, uh, texts on inflation targeting, uh, published by Princeton University Press, together with Ben Bernanke, uh, Rick Mishkin, and Tom Laubach. Um, from 2008 to 2011, uh, Adam, uh, having joined the Peterson Institute in 1997, took a sabbatical to serve on the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England uh, during a very critical period, not just for the British economy, but for the world economy. Uh, you know, for me, one of his... Uh, memorable um, forays uh, in his very outspoken tenure was a speech entitled, How to Do More. Um, and we certainly saw in uh, subsequent years that uh, more was indeed needed along the lines that Adam um, sketched. Um, you know, Adam's writing has focused on uh, Japan, on Europe, and the world economy in general. And I'm sure um, he'll have very uh, um, relevant remarks today. Uh, to Adam's left is Professor Joel Mokir, Professor of Economics and History at Northwestern University. He joined the faculty there in 1974 after taking his PhD uh, from Yale. Um, Professor Mokir's uh, work focuses on technology change and on uh, population. And, um, it really doesn't do justice to his contributions to say that he is one of the world's most eminent economic historians. Um, he's a past president of the Economic History Association. He's uh, editor of the Oxford Encyclopedia of Economic History. And uh, he won in 2006 the Heineken Prize in Historical Sciences given out by the Royal Dutch Academy uh, of sciences, and while, while this prize is less well known than the, the Nobel Prize, uh, it commands similar, similar status uh, among, among historians. Uh, Professor Mokir has written many articles, uh, many books, and his most recent book, A Culture of Growth, is uh, published by Princeton University Press in 2016. So um, you know, with that, I will turn it over to uh, Adam to begin. Thank you, Maury. I, I, I'm, as always, just frankly honored and flattered to be on the same podium as you. Uh, I have the welcome task of briefly trying to pick up and elaborate on what Maury already said about the big questions that bring us together. I do, since following in the footsteps of the three other distinguished people, far more distinguished people who spoke, want to just make one explicit thank you, which is not only to the Ministry of Strategy and Finance and our partners at the Bank of Korea for giving us such fabulous uh, hospitality and organization and audience, but particularly to the Asia Pacific Department of the IMF. My friend and colleague Cheng Yong Ri had the vision to think we could work together and address these issues and to hold this conference in Korea. And I also want to particularly thank Thomas Heibling of the Asian Pacific Department at the Fund and my colleague Jeremy cohen Seton at the Peterson Institute, who really helped drive the agenda and the very distinguished authors we have together. So thank you for that. Let me, let me turn to substance. Um, in theory, I have PowerPoint. Am I supposed to go there to do the PowerPoint? Okay. Thank you. So, um, okay, the one on the screen should now appear. No, no, there we go. Um, 
so I'm going to be actually relatively quick because it is very important you hear more from Joel Moak here. But I think the way to reformulate the question in less neutral terms than we've put it, but underlying the previous statements is can we formulate, can we develop a new Asian growth model? We have had such wondrous growth in Asia, not least in Korea, as Madame Lagarde mentioned, as we all benefit from and all appreciate. But there is a question of it slowing down. There is a question of it not being sustainable. And there is the question, as Maury raised, as made reference to in the issue of domestic growth, domestic-led growth by the bank Governor Lee, that it is not enough when countries become large and rich that they can go on the same export-led model. And even if, in theory, they could, obviously, there are limits to that politically. So what, in the context of slowing productivity growth, would be the new Asian growth model we can have? And to me, I think there's two aspects to this. There's how can we tell what really works, what's under any given country's control, and then can Asia overcome the slowdown in the rest of the world, the rest of the rich countries and the poor? And I think these two tracks, the domestic and the international, have to be kept in mind. When we talk about what works for an economy, we have to admit that growth is overdetermined. When we think about in the very narrow academic sense of running growth regressions, only having so much data and so many variables. But in reality, when we think of the list that Maury gave that others will address, there's demographics, there's technology, there's political stability, there's nominal growth, there's real growth, there's macro policy, there's financial policy. The worry is that if we look at jo Japan and Korea, and the deputy governor from the Bank of Korea, who will be presenting later today, has this argument, there is this seeming middle income trap or ongoing sort of permanent slowdown that cannot be avoided because of convergence to the frontier, because of demographics. But as Madame Lagarde said, and as every Westerner who comes to Asia must feel in their bones, Asia is very diverse along every dimension size, wealth, culture, demographics, geography. And so we need to get past that sort of sense of, oh, well, it's all predetermined because there's so much more that can be done. And we need to think about getting past some of the things that were the true, that, that were talked about when there was the true miracle, not, but which were not correct, about industrial policy and about capital accumulation in East Asia in particular that didn't seem to have much effect. And so that untangling that in a real world way, in a rigorous way, but beyond a simple regression is in many ways the purpose of this conference. But it's also a challenge in policy terms how we overcome the rest. We know the technological slowdown. We have heard Larry Summers speak of secular stagnation. We have heard, of course, the IMF speak about the new mediocre. And as my colleague Carolyn Freund and others have worked on, there is the issue of the slowdown in the hypergrowth of trade and where does this fit in? Or as our colleague on leave, Arvind Subramanian and others has written, there is the question of premature deindustrialization. If the trading system is not as open as it once was, can an India, can a Nepal, can a Cambodia or Myanmar really go up the ladder the way other countries did? We have the overhang of the financial crisis, which thankfully seems to be lifting. And then we have the global specter of near zero inflation. And so I think in this sense, and our colleague Olivier Jean will be presenting a very analytical paper on this topic, but the question is how does one assess the spillovers? And I will come out arguing that you have to think in Asia about the pluses and minuses of international integration. I don't think it will surprise anyone for me to say that international integration is the way forward, but we need to think about the challenges of channeling that. So we have this long list of questions, and in particular, hyperfinance seems to be harmful, but public investment seems to be useful in ways. I think it, it is important to think about these bottom two that we haven't already mentioned. Is employment stabilization or macroeconomic stabilization only something that is asymmetric, that we want to present the worst problem, prevent the worst problems, or is it something that if we run the economies hot, they create their own growth? There is no question now that mistakes and errors provide permanent damage. Our colleagues, uh, Larry Summers and Olivier Blanchard, working with some economists at the fund and others, have established the extent of persistence and hysteresis. 
but are we being wishful if we think you run the economy hot, it will go, it will have a similar benefit in the other direction? And this is something, unfortunately, the Trump administration will have to find out. Um, but it also leads to the issue of the vigilance on inflation. As, Laurie, as Maury kindly mentioned, I was one of the co-authors in one of the books, in one of the calls on inflation targeting. There is legitimate question whether both the level of inflation targeting that everyone pursued and the focus on inflation may have been harmful ex post, and we need to rethink that. It certainly seems a lot easier to maintain price stability than we thought it was going to be. If anything, we've got too much of it. And it certainly seems that low wage growth has really bad impacts in ways that people did not foresee. When we turn to the rest of the world, that's what Rao is meant to be, you know, is it the rich world's own problems? That includes Japan and the rich world. Um, you know, it, but if that's enough, if that's true, can Asia substitute for it for its own sake and for its own and for the world's sake? And is there a real problem that Asia, not necessarily China in the last couple of years, but other countries through currency appreciation and times manipulation in feedback loop with the protectionism that has emerged in the West, and my colleague Joe Gagnon has written about this, is this part of the problem linking back to trade? I mean, there's no question that, that exchange rate undervaluation has been a contributor both to growth and to trade decline, but it is hard to give it the full pride of place. Protectionism is definitely bad and definitely rising, and so the question is, can Asia, whether it's the leadership of President Xi, whether it is ASEAN, whoever, stand up against this? Professor Moak here is gonna talk about questions of technology and diffusion of technology, among many other things. But the fact that we've seen this global slowdown nearly simultaneously across the rich world does give credence to some of the Bob Gordon, Bob Solo kind of exogenous technological slowdown. As I believe the managing director as well as Maury said, we have this weird juxtaposition of so many great entrepreneurs, so many great ideas, and not showing up in the productivity statistics. But we know they're not in the productivity statistics because they're not showing up in the wage statistics, and they're not showing up in the growth statistics. And I think we should not cop out on this measurement. But finally, and again going back to some stuff Olivier Jean and others will address, is the West now exporting deflation to Asia? So Lee Brandstetter will give us some, some great advice on how to think about innovation going forward. And we have examples from Korea, from India, from Japan, from Indonesia we will discuss. But if, of course, in a literal sense, the slowdown in the West is exporting deflation. But there is also some hope that perhaps these nominal things are not as important as we once thought they were. And maybe that's not the constraint that should be blamed. Finally, one of the things about the Asian model that was talked about, at least in the US, but I think also by representatives of East Asia, particularly Korea, Japan, Taiwan, China in the West, was the idea that Asian economies had a more communal sense and were looking after the society and were less individualistic. This was pop culture, but many of you are familiar with these kinds of statements. And our colleague, uh, Arvind Subramanian did a book talking a while ago, he's now of course in India with Prime Minister Modi, but talking in terms of dominance, you know, is it China, is it the US being eclipsed, when does India catch up? But of course the challenge ultimately we have to care about is individuals and households per capita income, individual and households welfare. And growth is not necessarily just about the countries and the economies, it's about what we can do for the individuals. And that, of course, comes to, again, to issues of integration, to issues of migration, to issues of opportunity that are not just about individual countries. So finally, the question I would ask is, can Asia work together to grow? It is possible in the trade sphere, in international agreement for high standards to be Asian standards. We've just seen the huge increase in South-South FDI of trade, Public investment, there is a sense that keeps always gets blamed as being corrupting. It can be, but it need not be. I know we have representation from the infrastructure fund in Indonesia here. I know there are other examples. It doesn't have to be. Active monetary stabilization may indeed have a role that will allow countries to move together and not have currency conflicts. And most importantly, perhaps, the answer to, to demographic change is partly 
to mobilize women as the IMF and Madame Lagarde have said, as I in a smaller way have always said about Japan, but it's also about migration. And if the US and the UK are foolish enough to let those opportunities go by, Asia should not follow that lead. But it's also a question going back to the 20 years ago and the 10 years ago and the five years ago of the rising role of Asia in the IMF, in the World Bank, in the G20, in international institutions. Can Asia lead international economic cooperation? And obviously at some level it's a couple necessary conditions. The US has to be willing to give up some and China has to stay constructive. And that's not something the rest of us can compel. But as we've seen Japan, and as was mentioned by the Vice Minister, Korea increasingly moves to donor status, it demonstrates that you can make it to the top and you can help others. And it is possible in groups, in regions, to set aside currency manipulation and protectionism. That is, remember, where Europe started. So I think we have an agenda, and we're going to have a better understanding of why that agenda makes sense after this conference. I look forward to all of you engaging. I am grateful to all of our authors and contributors and to our partners at the ministry, at the bank, at the Funds Asia Pacific Department, and my colleagues at Peterson who made the trip. Thank you very much. Okay, Joel Mokir. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, <laughs> I'm a pure academic. I am not the president of anything or chairman of anything. I just teach and write, which is the way I like it. But, and I was asked by the organizers to talk about secular stagnation, or as they called it, the new mediocre. And that's what I'm going to do. And uh, as an economic historian, you start thinking about these things. And the first thing that, of course, pops to, popped to my, my mind was what I would now call, so the term would never occur to me before, is the old mediocre, which is that, of course, secular stagnation, which we sort of seem to be worried about today, is actually the way the vast majority of recorded history was. Uh, it was the norm. Economic growth uh, basically was, I would say, a negligible factor in economic history before 1800. I don't want to say the economies were entirely stagnant. That's not quite fair because you can, after all, compound over thousands of years, so there's some change. But basically, I say, whatever economic growth there was, it was extremely slow. We're talking about maybe 0.1% a year if we are to believe the numbers that Angus Madison has spent his life producing. Not only that it was low, but it was reversible. So years of growth would be followed by years of decline. Uh, it was vulnerable in the sense that um, serious shocks, whether they were natural or man-made, could set economic growth back for decades, sometimes for centuries. And finally, that the engine of growth is what we usually thought, think of as Smithian effects. That is to say, effects that result from more trade and gains from trade, um, institutional improvement, division of labor, the kind of things that Adam Smith was talking about. Uh, technological progress was taking place, but it was never, I think, powerful enough to have much of an impact on what we think today of uh, economic growth. And so what is happening in what we now call the Industrial Revolution is what we think of, think of in physics as a sort of a phase transition. And all of a sudden, the entire dynamics of the economy has changed, and we are in this sort of famous hockey stick effect in which sort of for a very long time nothing happens and then all of a sudden, zoom, you know, we are moving upward. I think that's probably something that is a, what most economic historians agree on. They agree on very little else, so at least we should stick this out. And so, you know, I asked myself the question, all right, so maybe this is silly, but why actually was there so little growth before the Industrial Revolution? And so I sort of made up this list, and others will disagree or want to improve it, but it seems to me that I'm capturing at least most of what, what's going on. The most famous and widely accepted um, mechanism that kept income low was what we call the sort of 
population or demographic negative feedback effect, which is very different from the demographic uh, problems that, that others have talked about before this morning. Basically, this is the Malthusian model, which we all learn in, in, in graduate school if you take a good economic history course, which basically says that there's an iron law of wages that keeps income low because if any positive productivity shock happens, immediately birth rate goes up, death rate goes down, you have more people, diminishing returns set in, and well, I, you are back where you started. So whether this is actually an apt description of pre-industrial economies is still up for debate, but clearly we can identify episodes in which, which are characterized by it. What is less, I think, emphasized, but in, to my mind quite important, what I think of as institutional negative feedback effects. And basically what it is, and I call this sort of predatory behavior or rent-seeking, what happens if a region or even a city is extremely economically successful, typically it will attract predators from the outside who are poorer but maybe stronger militarily to try to take this away from them and basically uh, you know, pillage them. This is what Mansur Olsen sort of called uh, roving bandits. And in fact, history is full of these roving bandits. And of course, what roving bandits do is, in some sense, they sort of kill the geese that lay the golden eggs. But if you're in a particular uh, uh, hurry, that's what you will do. And this happens over and over again, both in Europe and in Asia. And if anybody wants examples, I'll, I'll be glad to give them to you. The final and I think most fundamental reason why there is so little economic growth has to do with knowledge. And that is, this is an, not a technologically stagnant society, okay? Long before the Industrial Revolution, very important things were being invented, and we all know and love them, you know, the printing press and the compass and free field system, and on and on and on. But they were different. These were inventions that were different in a very important uh, way, and something that I, I, I keep always emphasizing, and that is, People got things to work, but they never quite understood why and how they work. There is really no scientific basis, or what I call an epistemic basis, of these techniques. So people were making steel, and they were fertilizing fields, and they were you know, uh, uh, carrying out certain medical procedures, some of which worked, some of them well, didn't. But nobody quite knew why these things worked. They just knew they did. And so the, the tricks, the, the, the were passed on from father to son or from master to apprentice, generation after generation, but nobody really asks, why does this work? That, I think, is where the world changes in the 18th and 19th century. So basically, I would put it this way. By the 19th century, all of those obstacles to growth were being overcome. Also, of course, at very different rates and different rates of different countries, okay? For one thing, the Malthusian feedbacks basically start disappearing a little bit before the Industrial Revolution, I think. And basically, the rest of the world undergoes a fertility transition, birth rates plummet. And insofar as the population is growing, productivity growth is fast enough to offset diminishing returns to labor. And so income keep, can keep going up, despite the fact that the world's population, of course, is growing uh, very rapidly between 1800 and, say, 1980 or something like that. More striking is perhaps the fact that in many industrializing nations, rent-seeking starts to decline in the 19th century. Um, there is some predatory behavior among nations, uh, but within Europe at least, which is why I know best, most of this predatory behavior <laughs> is directed towards non-European countries. Within Europe itself, certainly after the defeat of Napoleon in 1815, uh, there, there are very few wars, and even the wars that are there aren't really about predatory behavior there are about, about other things. Um, and so in that sense, I think uh, countries that became rich had less and less to fear about powerful neighbor in, neighbors inviting them. The most dramatic development, however, does occur in the field of useful knowledge, where, as I already said, science is increasingly trying to, and in many cases succeeding, explain why techniques work or, or don't. So, so armed with these three basically groups of, or types of phenomena, uh, can we make some sense uh, of our world today and venture, and this is very risky of course, uh, some tentative predictions about the future. So about Malthusianism, I can be very brief. Uh, if they, we have any problem, it is that our population is growing too slowly. Uh, this was pointed out, I think, in the, in the sort of classic article about secular stagnation by Alvin Hansen in 1939, who basically pointed out that the main reason why they, he thought secular stagnation was going to be the rule, which of course was a bad prediction in 1939, 
is that population growth was um, uh, coming to an end. And so, if anything that's what's going, you know, is concerned about, it's sort of the reverse Malthusian concern, which is aging, which people already talked about. Here are some numbers, you all know them, they've been mentioned, so I'm not gonna go to them, but yeah, we, the world is aging. I don't know, I mean, people sort of think of them as, a, <laughs> if, if this is bad news. You know, being 70 years old, I actually tend to think of this as rather good news. Um, uh, more to the point, perhaps, this is, after all, what everything is all about, right? I mean, we are finally reaping the results of technological change, of economic growth. Life expectancy is going up. What would you rather have, life expectancy going down? I mean, this is, this is ridiculous. Of course, aging is in itself a good thing. Now, it does have certain economic consequences that we have to think about, but by and large, I'd rather live in a population where the life expectancy is going up than one it's going down, and so would everybody else, come on. Um, now, what is true, as we all know, is that if current retirement ages are roughly maintained, then what is going to happen inevitably is aggregate demand will rise faster than aggregate supply, simply because dependency ratios are going up. You know, that may be bad news, but it certainly doesn't give any support for Larry Summers' concern about inadequate aggregate demand, you know, because you're increasing demand faster than you're increasing supply. I also am not too worried about how it's going to affect investment. You know, it will change the composition of investment, you know, basically to take care of old guys like me, you know, medical care, tourism, home services for the elderly, things like that. And, you know, fine, you know, if population changes, investment should uh, adapt. What's more, I think, uh, uh, striking is that, of course, it's going to affect the way governments spend money. Um, you know, uh, there will be growing expenses of pensions and uh, medical care. And so governments are probably going to run more deficits. So if you're worried about inflation, don't worry. It'll come back because this is exactly uh, uh, what governments are going to do. The main concern I have with aging is not so much about secular stagnation, it has to do with this sort of uh, flexibility of the labor force because the capacity to reskill is a negative function of age, which is anybody in this room should already by now know this, looking at the audience. Uh, and basically, we are, with rapid technological change, this kind of flexibility and agility is what we need, and that may be difficult with an aging population. Uh, all right, so, that, so much for the Malthusian story. How about predatory behavior? So, you know, I would think in international relations, um, it seems to me at least that at least as of today, and I'm not really extrapolating this into the future, small but rich states um, have very little to fear from their powerful neighbors, okay? Uh, we had one such attempt in 1991 in Kuwait, which is a classical predatory invasion, and the international community basically wouldn't let it stand. So this is now signaling to a lot of nations, and I think at this point in time at least, rich but small countries like Singapore or Luxembourg probably are fairly safe, even so they would not be able to defend themselves if they got attacked by, uh, by stronger neighbors. Now, there's no guarantee that this will continue. Um, where, of course, one is concerned, and this is something that I'm not totally sure how we will deal with, is there may be poor predatory nations with nuclear weapons who may engage in Nuclear blackmail. Uh, I'm not going to go into any detail. You all know what I'm talking about. Uh, this is a concern, and I'm not totally sure the wor world is quite ready uh, to cope with it. What about internal rent-seeking? Um, well, I have been asking myself for 25 years the question now, if the world is getting more or less corrupt, or which is sort of in calling, calling spade a spade, right? We were talking about rent-seeking. And basically, if you look at the Transparency International, the World Bank data, I mean, they all basically give you the same story, okay? The world seems to fall into sort of three classes of nations, okay? There are a bunch of nations where corruption is simply barely existent. It's always, there's always something, but it's, it's very rare and has no impact. You know, Norway, New Zealand, Singapore, you know where they are. Then you are, there are countries or, na or, or spaces where corruption is pervasive. And even though it's there all the time, and you see it in a daily life, it doesn't seem to affect the rate of growth all that much, okay? You think about what's happening in China, and in India, and in Turkey, in my state of Illinois, <laughs> I should add that. Um, 
And you know, it's, it's there, and you see it every day, but, but it doesn't seem to affect economic growth. But then, this world has countries in which corruption and rent-seeking is so pervasive and so brazen that it actually threatens property rights, it threatens enforcement of contracts, and therefore it weakens entrepreneurship, investment, innovation, on and on and on. You look at countries like Egypt, like Russia, like, like Nigeria, and the effects are, I think, widely recognized. And that is, is, of course, so what we really should be hoping for is that, you know, we see enough countries going from, from group three to group two. This has happened in some, in, say, Rwanda or Romania, uh, but whether this is a worldwide trend, uh, I can't really tell you. Um, but clearly, there's some hope that joining transnational organizations like the European Union may reduce corruption. And there's some hope that would, that was going to happen in, in Romania and Bulgaria, and maybe, maybe, it, maybe that's happening. Let me now come to the gist of my talk, which is what I'm, this is all about. And that is, what is the outlook for technology? So the world is full of technological pessimists or techno-pessimists. And they sort of come in two flavors, I should say. One is my much esteemed and misguided Northwestern colleague, uh, Robert Gordon's uh, technological slowdown hypothesis, which basically maintains, and I'm paraphrasing here, is that everything that could be invented has been, and the future innovation, well, it still still take place. It will have limited effect on humankind and too weak to forestall these other hindrances that he sees. There's another group of techno-pessimists, which actually are the apocalyptic uh, pessimists, who basically foresee a world in which people, in, in one form or another, will have been completely replaced and displaced by, by machines in some combination of malevolent robots, artificial in intelligence run amok, and more sinister ways in which intelligent non-humans of their own creation will create some hazy form of, uh, of uh, dystopia. So the good news is that those pessimistic predictions cannot both be right. <laughs> the better news is they can both be wrong, and they are. Uh, and so let me leave aside that those are more speculative predictions of the sort of various machine, machines each man kind of dystopia. I'm sort of sad to see that some really brilliant people like you know, Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk, they all seem to be subscribing that, to that, and I attribute that to reading too much science fiction when they were young. Uh, but I'm not going to really talk about that, also, though I do have a lecture about this. I, I, I want to talk about the possibility raised by Gordon and others, uh, Tyler Cowen and so on, that future technological progress will, will be slower. And I'll tell you why I think that is not going to be the case. And so here is, let me extend the analogy a little bit. The, it's not true that the low-hanging fruits have all been picked. But even if it were, the point is that science allows us to build taller and taller ladders to get to the higher hanging fruit. Okay? And what you really, really should think of is science and technology co-evolving together. Uh, because of course, scientific insights support technology, but technology equally supports science because it provides it with better tools, and of course, society provides better incentives. I won't talk about those either. So here's an historical example that I want to throw at you, although I don't like to make these historical analogies, okay? We look at what was known as the scientific revolution of the 17th century in Europe, okay? It blossomed in large part because people had better instruments. They could see things that couldn't be seen uh, before. You know, the most famous ones were the telescope, uh, the microscope, the vacuum pump. Uh, now, the same is true for, dis for later discoveries. The entire germ theory depended on the development of better microscopes to which people like Pasteur and Koch had access. Molecular genetics depended crucially on things like X-ray crystallography, which was invented in the early 20th century, and on and on and on, okay? And so, what, I'm, what you should ask yourself is, what kind of tools does science have to work with today? And how does that predict the technology that we will have? And the answer is mind-boggling, ladies and gentlemen. The new tools that scientists have today are so much more powerful than anything we had before, that everything that, we, that was achieved before would look like, like toys in the Industrial Revolution, like it's a minor blip compared to what was to come. So 
here are the instruments of the 17th century scientific revolution. Okay, on the right, you have uh, Robert Hooke's microscope. This is, of course, a drawing of it. And on the left, a, this is Galileo's telescope of uh, 1612. Of reconstructed, I must say, but there you go, okay? Now, think about what we have today. Compares Galileo's telescope with this. This is, ladies and gentlemen, um, in about a year from now, we will send into space the James Webb Space Telescope, okay? The Galileo's tel <laughs> telescope is a toy compared with that, okay? You don't buy this. You don't think telescopes don't do anything. Look at this. Louis Pasteur would have loved to have this, okay? This is a Betzig Held type of stimulated emission depletion microscope used in very widely in nanotechnology, uh, for which the inventors, of course, got the Nobel Prize in, I believe, 2013. This is you know, a vastly different tool than a microscope, also it essentially does the same thing. But we have so much more that don't, doesn't even have a precedent, okay? Think of lasers. Now, when lasers came first about in the early 1960s, everybody said, oh, you know, it's kind of fun, but what the hell do you do with this, okay? Now, we have thousands of applications for them in our economy. Uh, what I want to stress is not just that they happen directly in increasing productivity, if we could measure it, uh, but they are critical in developing further scientific research, okay? So this is a... a, a a, a self-contained quantum cascade laser at, at, at Northwestern, which I picture I took, so you see what this thing looks like. But what does it do? Well, I'm not going to read all this to you, you know, because this would take too much time, but these are just a sample of things that you can do with lasers that are just basically important in scientific research, okay? I'm just, let's look at the last two, two bullets. Uh, Laser infer interferometers have been used in this, what is known as the holy grail of modern physics, namely to establish the existence of gravitational waves, uh, which people have been trying to do ever since Einstein postulated them, and I think now we basically nailed that. Uh, the other thing, of course, and that's still not a success, is the holiest grail of all, even holier than the holy grail, and that's controlled nuclear fusion. So if we do that, the world will never be the same. So far, we're not there, but we're getting closer. And then, of course, computers. So I don't need to tell, to tell people here how you <laughs> we use computers for research. You know, my graduate students often ask, you know, it's not like what computers do for us. How did anybody in the world ever do compu uh, research with before computers? And since I'm old enough, to, and actually, there were computers when I, when I started on, but I still carried these sort of punch cards to the computer center. Uh, so this was not exactly Stata, uh, but still. But it's not just that. You know, what they allow us to do is to store, access, and analyze unimaginably large data sets. Forget big data. We now have mega data. We have super mega data. I don't know. I mean, uh, through deep learning, which is a technique that's just been developed in, in, in the last few years, we can analyze vast amounts of information for patterns and regularities that we could never possibly have thought about before. And they also allow us, and this is something that we as economists do, <laughs> they have opened new scientific discipline. Okay? There is a whole bunch of disciplines now that have the word computational before it. Okay? Computational chemistry, computational physics, computational biology. These can do things that would never have been imaginable in the 19th and early 20th century in turbulence, in solid state physics, uh, and on and on and on. When quantum computer comes, computing comes online and we're basically there, that is where they will have their biggest impact. Now, of course, with AI and artificial intelligence, uh, people are worried about it, that it's you know, going to replace jobs, blah, 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 blah. But we should understand that AI is also going to be a superlative research assistant. Uh, uh, and so, you know, not just literature searches, but just looking for patterns in data and on and on and on. So, there. so where do the pessimists go wrong? And I think the error in the thinking of people like Gordon is that they look at the direct effect of computers and lasers on the economy without understanding that there is a feedback in which these things affect science and that science will then affect very different areas in technology, which we can't, of course, predict, but we know they're going to be uh, there. I also think that the pessimists focus heavily on the digital economy. Um, and then people say, well, you know, Moore's law is basically no longer valid. There's some debate of whether it is or not. And so, you know, we've made computers better and better for a long time, but by now it's sort of slackening off. 
But I want to point out that we are really looking at a world of technological change that is way beyond digital. Freeman Dyson wrote a beautiful sentence in which he said, if the 20th century was the age of physics, the 21st century will be the age of biology. We are in the process, in fact, we, we are already doing that, of developing techniques that allow us to manipulate living beings at a level never thought possible, that Darwin wouldn't have dreamed about, okay? I mean, in, in medicine, in agriculture, and hopefully in ecology, we will be able to do things never, never imaginable. So you think about just what's come online. The last few days, the, the CAS9 techniques that allow us to edit, actually, DNA and allows us to design plants and animals to meet our specifications. Um, now, <laughs> people sometimes ask, well, doesn't this mean that we're playing God? Ladies and gentlemen, I have news for you. We've been playing God for 10,000 of years. God did not create poodles. We did. We're just getting better at it. And we'll do it so much faster and so much more effective. That is what we need, because we are going to have to adapt to a changing climate. So agriculture will have to do so. This is the way we're going to do it. Um, now, um, there will be new manufacturing uh, uh, techniques will come online. Um, we can talk about additive manufacturing or uh, three-dimensional printing. You probably all know it. I will skip this, this, this slide. If, we, if this comes about, it will be a true third industrial revolution because we will be able to do what is known as mass customization, which is essentially every product that you buy will be produced de novo, and that will be, and you may, be, you may not be able to do it at home, all of it, but certainly it's going to change the structure of industry in a dramatic way. Finally, and I think I'm going to skip this before we completely run out of time, uh, there is the question about jobs. What is going to happen to jobs? Uh, are, is this technology going to turn us all into lazy, vapid, bored people, as some of these dystopian novels suggest. And I want to make the three brief points, and then I'll shut up. Leisure. You know, history always had a leisure class. Uh, uh, in the past, we've had people who didn't work. It was one or two percent of the population. We basically know who they were. They were the aristocrats, the nobility, the landowners. In some societies, they were the priests. And, you know, and these people don't, don't seem to have complained about this all that much, you know? I mean, there's very few cases of some English lord, land-owning nobleman, who basically said, yeah, I feel really bored. I'm going to pick up a shovel and dig for six hours, you know, in the, in, 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 in the heat, because that's what work is all about. Nobody does that, ladies and gentlemen. When people find things to do when they're not working. And so if we ha happen to end up in a world in which people will work less, it won't be so bad. Uh, remember one thing, and that is the one area in which technology has been really a revolutionary in the 20th century is in leisure technology. I mean, the way, the things we enjoy today when we're not working in terms of the options we have in video games, in entertainment, flat screen television, you know, uh, spectator sports, none of that existed in 1880s, 1890. This is all 20th century production. It's fun not to work. In fact, there are people at the University of Chicago who claim that the reduced labor force participation, Eric Hurst and that, 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 that paper, that people basically drop out of the labor force because they're having so much fun playing video games. You know, I hope this is wrong, but, you know, if it's right, it tells you something about leisure. Uh, and so, what we may end up doing, and this is obviously a limiting condition that is still many decades, if not centuries away, if it really comes about, that the world is going to end up as not having to work. What you will see is only the people who want to work will work. That probably includes everybody in this room. <laughs> uh, uh, but, that's, but that's fine. I mean, the, 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 the distinction between leisure and work has become increasingly fuzzy over the last decades. And that, I think, too, is a sign of progress. And so, if in the limit we reach a situation like that, of pe only people who work will people who want to work, that is, I submit to you, an unequivocal improvement in economic welfare. So, conclusion. First, secular stagnation 
was a defining future of most of recorded history and has turned into sustained growth only in recent centuries and, of course, in Asia, really only in, in recent decades. Uh, that, I, I would say, the likelihood of the world reverting to a world of stasis, of, you know, basically zero growth, uh, is not high. There are legitimate concerns, and we all share them, about the sustainability of open institutions, of free trade, of mobility, of labor, and even of capital, and above all, of effective governance that are favorable to growth, and whether they will be able to keep pace with technological capabilities. And finally, of course, keeping up a high level of innovation will depend on ever-improving research tools and equipment, which will require investment by both private and public sector. Thank you. Um, thank you uh, to both speakers and uh, especially to Joel for covering everything from Malthus to DNA editing in, uh, in the space of a half an hour. Um, we have some time for Q&A, although uh, you know, we are generally a little bit behind schedule. Um, I, I think there was supposed to be a standing microphone, so I don't know if there are mobile microphones. Okay. There are people. Okay, so please let me open it up for uh, a few questions from the floor. And we are providing simultaneous interpretation service. So if you want to speak in Korean, you can do so. Okay. The Changyong Ri, IMF. <laughs> But it has to break ice, so, so I saw this my role. Uh, thanks very much uh, for Professor. I, I'm very glad to hear your more optimistic view than us who is worrying about new media for sequestration. But I find that you have a little bit more optimistic view on this aging. But by listening to you, if the old person has resources to live, enough resources to live, I think that, that this may be the case. But for Asia, what we are worrying about so-called Asia can be old before rich. So what happened in how you can defend your view if most of the Asians who will be aged in the next 20 years does not have much money to spend and then does not have much social safety net, unlike the uh, European and uh, American you know, advanced uh, Western countries. Still, I uh, think that uh, this aging is uh, less concerned. I mean, clearly you're right about that. I mean, it, it, it's, <laughs> it's not much fun to be you know, retired if you can't do anything, right? If you have no money to, to live. I would say, I would say the, 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 I would think of the distributional issues as being somewhat separate from technological issues. That is to say, we need to find ways in which we do two things. We have to have some kind of taxation system in which the people who actually work and earn can support the older generation. Um, I actually think most societies will be able to do that because I think technological change is going to push productivity and economic growth higher. Uh, there is no question that what you really need to do is ha when you redesign the safety net of society, and every society has some form of safety net, you know, social security kind of arrangements, that we take into account you know, that there are people in the higher brackets of uh, society uh, who are going to need some kind of support. But here's something that I would like to add to that. Uh, the Economist had a long sort of essay on aging um, earlier this summer, if I recall. One of the things that I point out is there's absolutely nothing sacrosanct about a retirement age of, you know, N, where N could be 62, 65, 70, or anything like that, you know. As I keep t telling you, and when you turn 70, you know, then people give speeches and they say, oh, 70 is where the 50 used to be. Well, if that's the case, why are we retiring people at that age, you know? Uh, uh, one way of maintaining these people is keeping them longer in the labor force, getting rid 
of mandatory retirement ages, which you know, we in American academia did a long time ago, thank God. But, uh, uh, and in fact, it's much of the American economy is moving in that direction. And Europe is now slowly but certainly thinking about it. But it still exists, and it's, you know, it's, it, it simultaneously creates two problems. It, it creates income problems for the people in those age brackets, because as you say, many of them, they have no income, and if their pensions are extremely small, they have a hard time making ends meet. But it's also throwing away good human capital. You know, we, you know, we retire people at 65 who are still perfectly capable of, of working with this sort of fallacious argument that we have to get rid of the old folks to make space for the new, which is going to be a re reincarnation of a 19th century economics argument that had been refuted a century ago. Uh, it's just not true. We should let people who are physically and mentally capable of continuing to work, we should let them stay on. And perhaps, if need be, adapt their job requirements. Maybe go to you know, three days a week, give them a part-time kind of option, uh, whatever. But keeping that kind of labor market p p uh, flexibility in mind should be an objective of policy. But writing off a large and growing section of the population of people over 65 or over 70 is a terrible waste. Yes. Uh, coming back to central bank issues, Adam, I have a question for you. You seem to indicate uh, that, uh, or you asked whether the focus on inflation was somewhat overdone. You seem to be thinking of something. Can you share that with us? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I was trying to tee up discussion, but uh, I, I, I think I've been thinking about this a lot, and I think it, it's a harder sell in Asia in some ways than in other areas. But you, you, I think we made the wrong call on central banks obsessing about inflation in three dimensions. First and most importantly, um, as has been well remarked on by many people, uh, w a number of us in the bank central banking community assumed that monetary stability was a sufficient condition or price stability was a sufficient condition for financial stability and real economic stability. And for a variety of lucky reasons, in the late 90s and early 2000s, that seemed to work. Um, but that turns out, I think we can say with great authority, was a, an ex post mistake, uh, that it was luck. It was not sufficient. Um, now, of course, that doesn't mean that if you worry about financial stability, you worry about employment, you necessarily have to sacrifice inflation. But you at least have to get past that narrow focus for central banks and macro policy. The second one, second issue, which actually I raised before I went to the Bank of England, but uh, Olivier Blanchard, Paolo Moro, Giovanni Del Ricchia raised much more prominently, is was the inflation target too low when everybody fixated on near zero? And of course now again, there's very strong argument and pretty wide agreement that when we're too close to the zero lower bound, having an inflation target that's that low uh, has problems. And then the third issue, which is probably the most controversial, although both the first and second have implementation issues that you know well and we all have to worry about. The third issue is just the genuine question, has the low inflation environment delivered what we wanted it to deliver? And again, I had raised this a bit before I went to Bank of England, but when I went to the Bank of England, I committed that I would serve the inflation target as constituted. So, I mean, let me be very clear. I, I, once I went there, I agreed to the terms of the deal. But if one looks at the experience of Japan, one looks at the experience of the U.S., one looks at a variety of other experiences, and for that matter, if you look at the academic research, the costs of low levels of inflation, even variable low levels of inflation in real economic terms seem to be quite small or hard to find. Um, to be fair, again, it also seems like the costs or the dynamics of low levels of deflation are much less destructive than we thought they were. I went in, as did many, with the 
presumption that deflation was horribly destructive and once it started it would be spiraling downward and what we've seen is it's very hard to get inflation back up but deflation in and of itself doesn't seem to be quite as bad as we thought it was. But I mean one can go back and Stanley Fisher and, Ru and Rudiger Dornbusch had a paper in the World Bank Economic Review I think almost 20 years ago now um, in which they talked about what they called moderate inflations. And sort of by the by they mentioned the fact that inflation below 12 or 14 percent annually didn't seem to do much harm. And of course everybody didn't want to ever admit that and we had people like Robert Barrow and others trying very hard to create results that showed inflation at low single digit levels actually was harmful for growth or investment or something. And that's not in the data. And so you end up with this, this, this game of people saying, well, the inflation target has to, or the inflation goal has to be 2% or 3% because otherwise, yeah, 8% may not be worse, but in reality, but it leads to the spiral of expectations. The central bank loses credibility. And again, that's not clear in the evidence. And I, sitting behind you is, you know, Subir Gokarn, who can talk about this much better than I can. But you look at India as a developing country, and if they tried to cram down inflation into the very low single digits, I think that would be a mistake. So those three things, that the focus on inflation structurally, institutionally, distracted us from other things, that the level of the inflation target in light of the zero lower bound is probably too low, and that the real dangers of the trade-off of keeping inflation low may not be anywhere near what everybody assumed. Um, it, again, I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to be scandalizing people with this, uh, ruining my chances if I had any to get back into a central bank of any country. Um, you know, and I'm not, I'm not standing up and saying, let's go back to 1975. If we print a lot of money, everything will be fine. But these are the things I had in mind as cautions for discussion. Okay, given the risk of overshooting the time limit, I'm going to declare the session closed. Um, I know some of you might have still questions, so I urge you to buttonhole the speakers bilaterally over coffee, and we'll all proceed to that uh, coffee break now. Okay, well, that was an informative and energetic first session, so please give them another round of big applause. <laughs> <laughs>